um, I'm going to start with a bit of a confession, I suppose, in that um, I don't really care very much about copyright. Um, <laughs> or perhaps I should rephrase that. Uh, I don't want to have to care about copyright. Um, you know, in the same way as every time I hop into my car, uh, I don't want to have to think about the specific road rules that might apply uh, in my journey. Um, you know, I understand why road rules exist and I want everybody to be able to travel safely, uh, but I don't want to have to think about whether it makes a difference, you know, the type of car I'm driving or um, whether it's, it makes a difference whether I'm going sort of direct from point A to point B or whether I just want to get onto the road and start exploring. Uh, you know, obviously mm. I don't want to stretch this... Uh, well, you know, if that was the case, then probably all I want to do is just sort of leave the car in the garage and stay home. So, what sort of journeys am I talking about? Well, um, as Margaret said, I answer to the label of digital historian. Uh, and what you are all asking is digital history. Um, well, an easy sort of answer is, I suppose, it's a response to the challenge of abundance. You know, traditional historical methods start to have trouble dealing with the vast amounts of source material that is becoming available online. Um, how do we find it? How do we use it? How do we just understand uh, this vast amount of material within some sort of context? So digital history helps provide uh, new tools and new technologies that enable us to make sense of all these wonderful riches. But of course, uh, as well as that, there's also some new possibilities which emerge uh, by having all this wonderful material available online. Uh, we can start to see new patterns across these large uh, bodies of primary sources. We can create new forms of analysis, uh, mapping trends in language over time, for example, looking at networks of people and places and how they're represented within these sources. Uh, and there's also, of course, just new opportunities to share new opportunities to take the analyses that we're doing and put them out there in the public, to enable the public to interact with them, to, uh, you know, to communicate and to collaborate with us in different ways. And really, I suppose, to explore what it is that we mean by the word access. Okay. Who's used the fabulous newspaper database at the National Library of Australia in, in the intro? Oh, there's still a few who haven't. You've really got to do it. Um, okay, there's more than, I think, 80 million newspaper articles in there now, from 1803 through to the 1950s mostly. Um, and really, it's changing historical practice, having that wealth of source material available. Um, and over the last few years, I've been looking at ways that we could use this database to sort of really go beyond just discovery, go beyond using the search box to start to think about how we can build analyses which take advantage of this uh, collected um, wealth of material documenting Australian culture. Different ways of seeing and using this sort of material. So, you know, how can we do some sort of large scale analysis using this material? Well, you know, first of all, we have to just start gathering it together in volumes that we can actually do stuff with. So one of the first things I did was I created a little Python script which just went and harvested lots and lots and lots of articles. So you'd give it a query, it would go off and it would download the articles, whether it was hundreds or thousands of articles, in a nice convenient form. Uh, the metadata, the text of the articles, and the PDFs if you had a lot of time and a lot of disk space. Um, and once you had that material uh, in the, that sort of convenient form, you could start to apply, uh, use sort of text analysis software of various kinds on it to actually start looking for those sorts of patterns. And one, just one example, uh, is there's an online tool, tool called uh, Voyant, uh, which uh, you basically just throw a whole lot of text at it and it gives you a number of ways of starting to explore that text. And in this case, this is about, I think, 250 newspaper articles, is quite a small sample, uh, which included the phrase atomic age from 1945 to 1946. Um, so I just harvested all that stuff, threw it at the Voyant, and it gives you these sort of different ways of looking at and analysing the text. Now that seemed pretty cool. It was a nice way to start, but, you know, it took a long time to download all those articles. And I started to think about other ways of creating big pictures, these sort of larger scale analyses. Um, ways of just sort of, you know, following a hunch, having an idea and pursuing it without having to download thousands and thousands of articles. So I created another tool called QueryPick. QueryPick's been through various versions. Um, this is a, a graph 
showing the uh, number of <laughs> articles within the newspaper database that mention the word copyright over time from 1803 through to 1954. Uh, what it does, instead of having to download all the articles, it just grabs the search metadata. So it just grabs the, the, the total number of articles for each year. So instead of taking hours and hours and hours to produce something, you can get this in a few minutes. You can go to Query Pick. Uh, it's online. It's public. In its current form, it's, it's basically a web application. So anybody can go in and create a new graph. Um, and quite a few people have. There's a, over 100 or so graphs that people have created there at the moment. Um, and one of the things I like particularly about uh, QueryPick is that it's also a sort of interface to the collection, to the newspaper collection itself. Because if you click on any point on that graph, it actually goes back off to Trove and it gets back the first 20 matching articles. So you can actually start to explore what, what's under all those points on the graph. So it becomes a way of actually getting in to those 80 million articles within Trove, a way which is framed around your particular research interests, something that you can share, something that you can uh, you know, work or collaborate around. Um, so you know, a new form of discovery uh, of that database. Now there's various other experiments which I won't spend a lot of time on, uh, which I've been playing around with using Trove. That's the query pick main interface. This, for example, if you're interested in the front pages of newspapers, this is the site for you. Uh, what you might not realise is that front pages haven't always had the news on them. For a long time, front pages had advertising on them. And for strange, unknown reasons, I actually was quite interested to try and work out when that change happened from advertising to, to news. So what I did, of course, was I downloaded four million newspaper articles from Trove. Uh, that's all the front pages. Uh, well, it was then, there'd be more now. Um, and uh, I subjected them to various forms of visualisation. So if you're interested, you can actually go in, you can start to look at where those changes happened, and the main thing you'll notice is that it's not uniform. You look at the different newspaper titles at different times, the changes happened at different times. Uh, and uh, you know, I think there's actually a lot of work to be done in actually looking at the sort of cultural circumstances around some of those changes, which one, st one day I might actually get to do. Um, you can play. This is a little game that I created using Trove called Headline Roulette. <laughs> All it does is it gets a random newspaper article from the Trove newspaper database, presents it to you without the date, and you have to guess the, da the year in which it was published. <laughs> uh, but you only get 10 guesses. Uh, as I always say, it's sort of cross between prices, right and hangman. Um, <laughs> And people tell me that it is strangely addictive. <laughs> uh, another one which is a bit harder to describe is a, a, a resource called The Future of the Past, uh, which um, is a, a sample of newspaper, 10,000 newspaper articles in this case, which included the phrase, the future. I won't try and describe what it does. I'll just invite you to go in and have a play with it and to just point out to you that once you get to a particular year within that resource, you can actually use it to create your own fridge poetry. Uh, and people have been creating poetry from the words within those articles. I mean, the whole point of it was to really explore the evoc evocative power of the words themselves rather than constantly trying to reduce them to data or to points on a graph. And that was my point in trying to play with that. Okay, so in all this stuff, I'm basically working with newspapers published um, before 1954. Um, so there's no sort of you know, copyright issues. Of course, the problem is that history ends in 1954 when you're doing these graphs, which is... <laughs> A bit stupid, but uh, and, and you know there are problems in trying to link that up to other newspaper databases around the world, both technical and legal problems. It would be great if we could do these comparisons across other countries. It does, query pick, I should say, also includes New Zealand. You can actually search across papers past the database, so you can do some comparisons between Australia and New Zealand. It would be good to be doing comparisons across you know, Britain and other places as well. Now, Trove has an API which makes this sort of stuff easier. But when I started doing it, it didn't have an API. So what that meant was that I had to resort to all sorts of horrible things like screen scraping, basically reverse engineer, uh, engineering interfaces, following HTTP headers, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, but, and the reality is that uh, the sort of work that I do um, in trying to extract machine readable data from cultural heritage sources and play with it, 
I still have to resort to those sort of techniques. So those sort of nasty screen scraping type stuff. Um, most recently, for example, I was uh, trying to scrape information about World War I records from a variety of sources, including the National Archives of Australia, the Australian War Memorial and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. I created the scrapers for a particular project and I thought, well, you know, I could actually put these together and make a little interface. Um, so that's what I did. I created this site where anybody can enter a name and I'll search across all those databases and present you back the results. So it's sort of an aggregated search, if you like, which I've just built on top of these series of screen scrapers. And it's become very, very popular with family historians, perhaps not surprisingly. Now, in doing this sort of reverse engineering, this basically hacking, I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. I don't think I'm breaking any laws um, or breached any terms of service indeed. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to be certain. Um, you know, I'm very public about what I do. I share the products, I share the code, I talk about what I'm doing all the time, perhaps too much. But I still feel sort of guilty in doing some of this sort of stuff, as if I'm sneaking around. And with the rhetoric that, you know, we, we've been getting recently about threats of cyber terrorism and evil hackers and the horrible, horrible circumstances around the death of Aaron Schwartz, you know, it makes you feel like doing anything other than using the supplied interfaces is bad. Um, and that really suggests to me that it's not just a question of law that we're talking about, it's a question of culture and politics and language and rhetoric. The question that I keep coming back to is what do we really mean by the word access? Another project I'm working on is something called Invisible Australians. Invisible Australians is about surfacing records relating to the administration of the White Australia policy, which are held by the National Archives of Australia. These sorts of records. As part of the project, we've created a wall of faces. Uh, this has about 7,000 images on it at the moment. This just represents uh, stuff from one series within the National Archives. It'll keep scrolling for an awfully long time. You can sort of see, if you click on one, where the records, where those images have come from. So in order to create this wall, I downloaded about 12,000 images from the National Archives. Again, reverse engineering the interface. I ran a facial detection script over those images and uh, pulled out the portraits. And then it was a case mm. of you know, creating a database, some jQuery, smoke and mirrors in order to create the interface. And so it took a, you know, a bit over a weekend or so. Um, and what we ended up with was something which is, you know, I think, quite compelling, uh, quite challenging, and uh, quite discomforting, and, and often quite moving. And we've had people email us saying that they've been in tears scrolling through the wall of faces. Now, when I present this, I'm often asked, you know, what's the copyright situation of these documents? And I'd say, I don't know. Uh, well, you know, I'm not really certain. <laughs> um, and it, but the question reminds me of a talk which was given by Michael Ascarides at the National Digital Forum in New Zealand in 2011. Because what he did was he challenged us to look beyond the problems that we see in our way in order to find a better set of problems. What's the copyright status of these documents? A better problem is the responsibility that we have towards the people whose lives are documented within these sources. That's a better problem. It's a more important problem. You know, and that's where intellectual energy should be pointed. And we have to remember that there's power in the bureaucratic categories that determined if somebody was deemed to be white. There's power in the record keeping system which contains the remnants of this bureaucratic system. There's power in our aggregations of open data. Every API is an argument. And sometimes we have to confront that power. We have to ask the difficult questions, cross the boundaries, seek more, and hack interfaces. Because ultimately I think you know, access can never simply be given. On some level it has to be taken. Access to me is not an act of gratitude, compliance or consumption, but of resistance. And we have to find ways of encouraging those people who struggle with the power of data and who try and take us new places on new journeys. We have to give them the support and confidence to explore. Thanks. <laughs>